be brothers and sisters in Christ, bought and made children of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, which has been promised since the beginning of time. Thanks be to God. Amen. Do you always feel like rejoicing? I mean, sure, there's times where it's pretty normal to rejoice. Like if you are about to have a baby and then you have a successful delivery or you just got a promotion at work or a bonus check or maybe you just graduated from school and you're all excited that you made it through. Whatever the circumstance, it's probably pretty natural for you to think, yeah, I would rejoice that. I would celebrate. That is a very exciting time. But just as, just as common as having a situation where you wouldn't want to rejoice. Like after a terrorist attack, or a diagnosis of cancer, or breaking your arm, or losing a job, or losing a friend. You really don't feel like rejoicing right then. So why would Paul say to us in our text for today, twice, rejoice, always? Is that even possible? What's going on here? As we walk through this text today, I hope for you, you realize that this is not only possible, but it's pretty automatic for those who trust in the Lord. The first thing we need to do, though, is clarify some terms. Joy and rejoicing are not really the same as happiness and celebrating, at least not how we normally use them on a day-to-day -day basis. Happiness, what is it? If you would define happiness when you're thinking about it, what is it that makes you happy, it's kind of hard to put your finger on it. It may be in a certain situation, but then another day, maybe not. It may be someone that you're seeing, but at another time when you see them, maybe it doesn't make you as happy. See, the thing about happiness, the way that we think about happiness, is that it is pretty much all about how we feel. So what we think happiness looks like is feeling good, Maybe being lighthearted, it's really easy to have small talk, to be a little bit giddy or giggly. That's normally what we see as someone being happy. But joy is different. The word joy hasn't quite been changed yet. And when we think of joy, it may be shown in emotions. But joy really doesn't sit in how you feel. Joy is something much deeper. For example, you may have joy if your friend has gotten a new job, and it's going to be a great job for them, but it's going to mean they're going to move far away. But you're very joyful for them because you know this is a good thing for them. You know it's the best course of action. And yet you can be extremely sad that they're going to move away. It's that balance of having that deep, sense of joy, and yet at the same time being sad, so not happy maybe in the way that we were thinking about. The same is true with celebrating and rejoicing. We may feel that a celebration means that we have to have a party, and we're running around, or we're dancing, or just big expressions of emotional happiness. But when we talk about rejoicing, it can be the subtle on your knees, praying at the end of the day, rejoicing that your family is alive and that they know and care about Jesus. That, by itself, can be simple and beautiful rejoicing. The author of this letter gives us such a beautiful picture of that. We talked a bit about that last week. The letter of Philippians that we are going through the last week and this week is from Paul right before he is going to die. And he's in prison in Rome all by himself, surrounded by soldiers. No real reason to feel happy or like celebrating as he sits there in chains. And yet, he says to his congregation, in that circumstance, rejoice in the Lord. Always. I will say it again, rejoice. 
gives us such a beautiful picture of what God is giving us. Not something that can make us happy sometimes, but something that gives us joy no matter how bad our life looks, no matter what we don't understand, no matter how much we are hurting. Paul says we can rejoice all the time. And these words he got from God. What is the reason why? What's at the heart of why we can rejoice nonstop? It comes down to these beautiful promises of God, right? As we read Scripture and we look at it, we look at it as the very words of God. And we trust that He will keep His promises. Promises like He gave to Adam and Eve when He said... Someday down the road, I will crush the serpent's head. And with that, I will restore what was lost. This perfection that disappeared, I will restore it. And he did. God promised to Abraham that he would have a son. And then through that son, he would have descendants that would bless all people. And Abraham did have a son. And that descendant did come. He promised through prophecy after prophecy that a baby would be born of a virgin. And that baby was born for you and for me. God promised that an innocent lamb of God would go to the cross and die for you. And Jesus did. Jesus promised to his disciples that he would be with them and all who trust in him for every day of their lives so they would never have to feel alone. And he is. Jesus promised that he would come back and take us to be with him forever. That he would prepare a place for us in heaven. And he has and he will. God promises that no matter what bad happens in your life, he will overcome it just as he overcame the cross and rose to life. And you know he good. Because the thing about God's promises is they always come true. The thing about God's word is that every word was written for you to feel comforted and safe. The reason we rejoice is that no matter what happens negatively here in this world, no matter how we feel emotionally, God still loves us and his promises will come true. The thing about faith is that it's not about your emotions. You may hear that quite often. It's how worked up you are about Jesus. It's how crazy emotional you are and jumping off, off the ground. Or, But it's not. That may come from a beautiful faith, and you may be jumping up and down. But faith is given from God. It's deeper than the way you feel. It's deeper on what your commitment level is today. It's given from the Holy Spirit. He builds that in you so that even when you feel terrible, when you're not happy, when terrible things are happening, the world is falling apart around you, you still know that God loves you and that Jesus died for you, even if you can't feel at the time. That's why the rejoicing is possible all the time. But it's really hard to hold on to that feel and that understanding. We get easily distracted. And so Paul in our text leads us through several things that we can do to stay focused on him so that we can nonstop rejoice every day of our lives. And the first thing that he says today is, let your gentleness be evident to all. You may ask me, how is gentle going to help me rejoice? How is that going to keep me knowing that God loves me each and every day so that I don't get overwhelmed with everything that's happening around me? Well, being gentle or big-hearted allows us to practice what we know deep down. I've heard many people that have struggled with 
emotional ups and downs who have a really hard time staying positive say to me that the thing that helped them be positive most often and to really understand and remember what God says to us was when they were helping and serving others. And why is that? Because a lot of time when you're helping others, you're not thinking about yourself all the time, step one. And two, you get to see the love of God through your own hands being given to someone else. So what does that do? It puts your actions, your actions make known what you know in your head real in front of you. It makes it actual. So you see it and you practice it. And the words that you know coming out of your mouth is you help someone else and encourage them and it fills you with joy. The Lord says, test him on the things that he has promised. And he says, if you do my work, you will be blessed. You will see these blessings and you will help others. You will be my instruments, my ambassadors. And it's true. We focus our hearts in our minds, on serving God and serving others, you'll find that you'll be more and more joyful. It's the beautiful thing about serving the Lord. He blesses us more and more and more. The second thing that God tells us to do that will help us rejoice in all circumstances is to pray. Paul identifies another problem that is a roadblock for all of us. Anxiety. We are so filled with anxiety all of the time. I know I struggle with this constantly. If something small goes wrong, it sets off a chain reaction of all of these things that I think are going to happen, this domino effect. I see this one thing going wrong, and I visualize all the rest of the things that could possibly go wrong. And there's about a hundred different ways that that could happen. And I'm sure that one of those ways is going to happen. And my anxiety builds on itself. Anxiety is also one of the biggest things that causes us to be sad and depressed and feel extra lonely and abandoned because we feel that we need to take care of and control everything and be able to fix it. Why would prayer help with that? Some of you are managers, or have been on a sports team, or on a work team, and you know what the value is of having someone that you trust on your team to give a task to. Because then as soon as you give them the responsibility to take care of that task, you can completely forget about that responsibility. You don't have to worry about if it's going to get done or not, because you trust them to take care of it. Same thing, even on a sports team, you have someone who's up front, you as a defender do your job of stopping the ball from getting into the net. And you trust your forwards on the soccer team. You trust your forwards to score the goals in the front. That's not your job. That's theirs. This is even more true when we come to the one who controls all things. So Paul says to us, pray. Because when you pray, you give up your control of a situation. You acknowledge that you cannot control everything in your life and that you need God's help for every hardship that is in front of you. And when you pray, you say to God, this is your responsibility. I can't carry it on my own. And when you do, you can let it go and trust the one who gave you Jesus, who created this world, to take care of you and everything that is going around with your family and with your life. Paul says, pray with thanksgiving. The other nice side effect is when you pray, you realize all of the things that God has given you already. And all the more reasons you have to give thanks to Him for this peace of mind that you can have. And that leads us to the third reason that Paul gives us, that we can rejoice always. This is really the greatest of all. The peace of God which transcends all understanding guards your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. Think about what the angels said to those shepherds when they were out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord 
appeared to them and said, Do not be afraid. I bring you news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And then all those angel armies appeared and sang to those shepherds and to us, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is what brings complete peace in the darkest days of your life. Not necessarily that you will feel happy or that you will want to celebrate every moment. But what you know is that you have peace with God. No matter what you have done, no matter who you were in the past or how you have felt, God has been reconciled to you through the blood of Jesus Christ. This baby came so that you would know without a doubt that you can have peace for this life and into eternity. That peace of God is what gives people comfort even when they face their own death. If you want to see this peace of God, go to the deathbed of one of your friends, a Christian, who knows this truth about Jesus, and you see them with full confidence look you in the eye and say, I'm not afraid of death. Why? Because I know that my Redeemer lives and that in my flesh I will see God. They're not afraid. They're at peace with their life and what is to come because they know God loves them. And will take care of them for all eternity. If you want to see rejoicing, the kind of rejoicing that Paul's talking about, even in the worst of circumstances, go to a Christian funeral. When you go there and you see pain and sorrow, sadness and grief, it's sad. And you see that and it's hard to look at. But what do you also see? You see a deep-seated joy and rejoicing. We often talk about Christian funerals being victory celebrations. Why would that be a celebration when one of your loved ones dies? Because all those who are gathered here who know Jesus know with absolute confidence that their loved one is in heaven forever. And that they too will join Jesus and all the saints in heaven. That is the perfect example of how we can be sad and yet extremely joyful and rejoicing. This is why Paul says that we can rejoice always because no matter what happens to us in this life, no matter what comes after us Christian in our country as the days go on, we can rejoice because Jesus holds the victory and that he is near. He has died, he has risen, and he will come again. We look to this little baby at Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about, because he has changed everything. And that that baby, now man who has died, will come back to save us all. So try to get better at dealing with anxiety. I have a really hard time with that. But Paul says, go to the Lord in prayer. Work on remembering that even if peace in this world doesn't look so good, that God has made peace between you and Him. Paul tells us to rejoice all the time. And all the time, because God is good. Let us continue to share that, be gentle to those around us, practice this to our family, to our friends, rejoicing that God has given us eternal life forever. Amen. Please rise.